the, um, the next talk is, um, is about uh, the interesting topic, machine learning interviews, lesson from both sides. The use of machine learning in industry is so recent that most companies are still trying to figure out what skill to look for when hiring for machine learning roles and how to access those skills. This makes it hard for candidates to prepare. Bay in Silicon Valley, Huyen Chief is currently working as senior deep learning engineer at NVIDIA, where she focuses on productionizing AI research. In this talk, she will go over a different type of uh, machine learning roles, the recruiting pipeline for those roles, and the interviewing process. And this also will give you the practical tip for candidates apply and interviewing for machine learning role. So for all AI uh, engineers out there, please get your pen and paper ready. Welcome on stage, Huyen Chief. Hi everyone. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks Hung for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about machine learning interviews. Um, so I'm working on a book on machine learning interviews, and uh, most of my research comes from companies in uh, the U.S. and Europe. So I don't know a lot about machine learning in Vietnam except from those so headlines, and you know those headlines are full of hype. And um, so I would really appreciate it if uh, after my talk, people can, if I say anything wrong or not accurate then please correct me. And also, I also think that nowadays a lot of, so I have interviewed people, and I interview people like engineers uh, and researchers from different countries, and I notice that people from, engineers from Vietnam are really good. So I think that a lot of people here might aim for companies overseas. So I hope that this talk can be relevant to you as well. Um, so yeah, so the first I'm gonna talk about machine learning jobs, the different types of jobs, such as like, research engineer, uh, machine learning engineer, uh, re researcher, uh, understanding the interviews, uh, the interviews mindset, and understanding the recruiting pipeline. So machine learning jobs, um, then machine learning is, the use of machine learning in the industry uh, is very new, and there are a lot of like confusing type roles. So the first question that a lot of ask me is that like, what is the difference between research and applied research? So like a lot of companies, for example, NVIDIA has a research lab and the applied research lab, which is where I work. So in summary, research is to expand, um, to push the boundary of theoretical knowledge, and applied research is how to apply the theoretical knowledge into production. For example, in, in research, you might come up with a new technique to work on um, image recognition, uh, and you might apply it on a very small data set for the C400 or ImageNet. ImageNet is not that small, but it's a very standard, standardized data set. And applied research might try to bring the technique and make it work for like a million of users. Um, so the second question is, uh, is that like, what even is a machine learning engineer? So I'm a deep learning engineer, which might be considered, so some people can call it like a machine learning engineer. Um, so I think that's a point we mentioned in the previous panel is that um, a lot of researchers are not good engineers. So researchers are scientists. They come from a scientific background. So they might come up with really new, uh, they, they might be able to like reason about theoretical, theoretical constraints, um, but, they, they, and, um, but they don't have time or might not even have good engineering skills to build a good, uh, to write good code. So engineers are supposed to be the people who help them bring that into, uh, to bring the ideas into, to realize the ideas. But, the, but in a lot of companies, um, the distinction is not very clear. First of all, open, at OpenAI or Google Brain, you can see that um, researchers, some researchers can be really good engineers, and you can also see engineers coming up with new ideas. So you can see paper, paper for example, um, uh, the GPT-2 GPT paper from OpenAI, or the BERT model from, um, from Google, you can see that like um, engineers and researchers are both equal first author on the papers. So the distinctions are not clear. Sometimes at some companies they have like the distinction like you have to have a PhD to become a re researcher, or researchers get paid more. But it really depends from like varies from company to companies. And also, um, so the use so doing research is very expensive. So not many companies can afford to do pure research. Because companies are maybe like too uh, worried about how to get make money, how to productize the research, like how to build good product, and they cannot afford to invest a lot into research. 
So in a lot of, of, of um, so so in a lot of smaller companies, the machine learning engineer might work more with just data, like uh, how to like collect data internally and how to wrangle the data, how to clean the data. So in that capacity, a machine learning engineer might not be different from a data scientist. So people can ask me, like, so what is the difference? So data science is a discipline of working with data. And so because machine learning tries to uh, build models from data, so in a way, machine learning is part of data, data science. The difference is that data science might, or data scientists might help, uh, might try to look at data and help companies make business decisions and a machine learning engineer might look at the data and build some product out of it. So that might be the difference. Um, so, and also like data scientists are scientists. So they are not supposed to be good engineers. But machine learning engineers are engineers. So they're supposed to be really good engineers. Um, one thing I want you to notice is that machine learning at big companies is very different from machine learning at uh, startups. So it might be important for you when you look for a job you should care about, you should look at the size of the company and try to understand what, what exactly they mean when they say machine learning. Um, so, so one, one job we usually have with, with companies that when companies, uh, when our clients come to me and they go like, we would like to do what like big, uh, we would like to do what big research lab like OpenAI or DeepMind are doing. And I was like, do, really? Do you have a billion dollars to spend? Because you know like last year DeepMind got into a billion dollars loss, or like debt and um, and OpenAI like get has to get a billion dollar investment from from Microsoft. So um, the, the estimated cost of training Alpha Star system at DeepMind is like twenty six million dollars. Um, so a lot of uh, big company only big companies can afford that, and startups cannot. Um, another thing is that like big companies can afford specialists. So you can be really good at doing one thing. For some, you can be really, really good at building machine learning, uh, like um, machine translation system and you don't have to be good at anything else. And it's fine. So like Google, DeepMind, OpenAI can afford to hire people like that. But as startups, they cannot, uh, startups cannot afford to hire specialists. As startups, you don't even really know what, what you need to do tomorrow. So startups want people to do a lot of things at the same time. So startups usually hire generalists. Um, at big companies, the bigger the companies, the more standardized process is. So if you interview at Google um, or Facebook, you can see that they have step-step process. And you have to go through all of them. But at startups, they, they have to make decisions very fast. And they can tailor the process to your need if they really want you. Um, so and another thing is hiring for senior and jun junior roles. Depending where you are in the career, the hiring, the recruiting process might be different from, this, uh, from other people's. For example, so I talked to a lot of hiring managers, and they say like when they hire for senior, for senior roles, they hire for skills. Because if you all have like 10 years experience, you're supposed to be really good at what you're doing. But if, when they are hired for junior roles, they hire for attitude. For people who might not be an expert in what they do yet, but they have the attitude, they're willing to learn, they're willing to work hard, and to become a good fit of the company in the future. Um, so many people like, so these are two of the messages I get from uh, candidates. So people keep telling me that like, they really want to do machine learning, but they, they don't have a PhD and nobody's hired, nobody's gonna hire them because they don't have a PhD. So um, I would say that, no, you don't need a PhD to do machine learning. Um, so you have so, like the only, um, several companies, they say they hire PhD for some deep mic, when they say that they uh, are like Google brain, when they hire for a researcher, they, they, need, they list PhD as a requirement. Um, but those researchers' roles actually make up a very small role in the machine learning ecosystems. Because not many people can hire, can afford, not many companies can afford to hire a researcher. So the major, majority of roles you see in machine learning can be machine learning engineers. And engineers don't need PhD. And even as those big companies, when they claim that you need PhD to apply, you can see plenty of examples of people who are really good researchers that they don't even have PhD. Um, so for example, here is a, a job listing for a research scientist at OpenAI. You can see they have only two requirements, and none of them has a PhD on it. And the CTO of OpenAI actually doesn't have a PhD. Uh, I also thought it was very funny when I look at this. Um, 
uh, when I look at the uh, agenda this morning, and I realize that I'm the only one who doesn't have a PhD here, but I'm also the only one who is an engineer. Um, but yeah, so I just want to say that you don't need a PhD uh, to do machine learning. Uh, so the next step is trying to understand the interviewer's mindset. Um, so looking for a job can be very, very stressful. Um, and it might help if we understand what interviewers or what companies are looking, are looking for. So if candidates hate job search, companies also hate hiring. It can be very expensive for companies. For example, in the Bay Area, uh, when company, a lot of companies have to work with a recruiting agency and they charge a flat fee of like 20 to 30% of the first year salary to get a good hire in machine learning. And if, you, if a machine learning engineer makes about like $200,000 a year, then that cost can be easily up to like $60,000 per hire. So it's very expensive for companies to hire. It's also stressful for hiring managers because some companies, they have a very strict head count. If the manager set out to hire somebody for, for, for a position and, and they cannot hire, it's gonna be a very bad look on, on the hiring managers. And it's very, inter, it's very boring for interviewers. So when you start working, you have to interview people. Like you, have, you want to work on the stuff, but then you, and then you have like, if you have to interview two people a day, it's already two hours of the time, out of eight hours. So it's very stressful and annoying and boring for interviewers as well. Um, so people say that like, companies always say they want to hire the best people for the company, which is not true. Companies don't want to hire best people. They want the best people that can do a reason, they, can, they want people who can do a reasonable job within the money and time constraint. So first of all, like if there's a candidate that can do a job like, can do 90% of the job, but cost $100,000 and six months to hire. And another candidate who can do like 85% of the job, but only cost like $10,000 to hire in like two weeks. Then of course we can go with the second candidate. So companies are okay with missing out on the best candidate. So sometimes really the best people still get reject, rejected from companies just because they don't fit into the pipeline and companies are okay with that. Um, so you would, you would like to think that like when companies hire, they know exactly what they are looking for, uh, which is so not true. So except for a few big companies, when they know, like when they have a routine task and people know like what the person is gonna do when they join the company. Most companies have no idea what the employees are going to do. So for imagine a startup. So you have a company, you have a lot of data, and somebody tell you like, hey, you should turn those data into some products. And you try to hire machine learning teams. And you have, because you have never done machine learning before in the company, you don't know what a machine learning team is gonna do. So when, uh, so you just know that you need some, some, some people like that. So when the HR asks you for like requirements or job descriptions, you just want to try up to come up with some very generic job descriptions or like um, requirements. So a lot of time, job descriptions and requirements are just for reference. Like you can feel free to like apply for jobs even though you you don't have the requirements listed because requirements are for reference only. Um, and so most recruiters are not very good at uh, evaluating technical skills. So when you apply for, uh, when, when, when you apply for a job, unless you're referred, or unless you're reached out by recruiters, you have to pass a recruiter's uh, resume screen. So, re so the recruiters could look at the resume and decide whether you can move, can move you to the next route or not. Um, so because recruiters are not engineers or not technical people themselves, so they cannot access those, those skills. So they look for very quick signals, such as like, who did you work for before, like the previous employers, so if you work for Google or Facebook before, it shows that you have very strong, so you must have passed the interviews processes before, and um, so they use very good signals, or like degrees, what schools you went to, like awards or papers that you have, or like you look at the open source project, or like GitHub or Kaggle kernel, and so referrals, like who refer you to the company. And the next thing is that like, most interviewers that you meet will be bad interviewers. So I was very surprised when I started doing research for my book, and I noticed that even big companies, like Facebook or Google, have very little training for the interviewers. So what happened is that like you join a company, you, you shadow a few interviews, and then you have to interview yourself. So the interviewers are not very different from the interview, you know, from the candidates themselves. 
Um, and also notice that like so the companies with the best interview experience are companies with a rigorous training process for for interviewers. Uh, I think we can skip that because of the term uh, constraint. And one one point I would really want to highlight to candidates is that interview outcomes depends so many depends on so many different random variables. It can depends on um, uh, it can depends on like the interviewers' moods that day, the mood they perform, like or how well it feels that day, or how much of the overlap of expertise between interviewers and you. For example, if an interview, interviewer only knows about A, B, C, and you know about D, E, F, then the interviewer will not be able to like assess the knowledge of, um, of uh, D, E, F. And in, in, in the eyes of the interviewer, you might be a bad candidate, but actually you just you just know dif you just have a different set of knowledge from the interviewer. So if you get rejected, it's not an indication of your ability. So I would encourage people to like keep applying. Companies know that too, so it's a regular, it's a very common practice for companies to like reach out to candidates they have rejected before. So if you get rejected from Google like after onsite, they might very well reach out to you like after a year and try to interview you again. Um, so I think I think um, so. How many how many more minutes do do I have? So five more minutes. Um, so yeah. So we're gonna go up or go over the recruiting pipeline very quickly. Um, I'm, I would love to learn about like the interview pipeline for machine learning roles in Vietnam. So this is usually the standard pipeline. So the first is resume screen. So unless you're referred from a, from a, from a company, um, so you're referred by somebody inside the company. Then, uh, if you just apply directly, then you might have to go. So you're gonna have to go through a re resume screen, which is usually done by by a recruiter. So this is when you have to need uh, which signals like previous employees, awards, degrees, what like big school names to try to impress them. Uh, the next step is like coding challenges or take like coding challenges. Like companies might just send you very simple coding challenges to make sure that you know how to code. Um, some companies have replaced it with take-home assignments, so they give you, give you a project that might take like two to three hours to do, and you submit the solutions. Um, so one thing that I want to highlight about this step is that a lot of companies face very good indications of how well the candidate can perform in the job, because if you can solve a problem, a project at home, like in the comfort environment, then you might be able to do it at work as well. But it actually is a big, um, it's actually harm, like uh, the minority group. For example, like if in Vietnam, um, if uh, when when a man works, then he can go home and doesn't have to do housework and doesn't have to, have to take care of children. But if a woman and you have children, like after work you still have to go home and take care of the parents, take care of the kids, and you will not have time to complete take-home assignments. So, so take-home assignments will actually punish candidates who don't have time to work for free. So I would uh, really hope that companies look into that and try to think of like the time com uh, implications of their requirements. So I talked to, uh, to a few startups and they always told me this, like they always confuse because like, they interview candidates and they give, home, they give them take-home assignments and they don't understand why like female candidates never turn in their assignment but only male candidates do. It's because like female candidates don't have time to do it. Um, so the next step is typical off-site interviews which is usually like one or two interviews, like via phone or like conference calls. Uh, so the interviewers will, will like ask you technical questions, either coding questions or non-coding questions. And after that, if you pass the technical on-site interviews, then they can bring you to the off-site interview, oh like, sorry, on-site interview. Um, a lot of it might require traveling. So first of all, if you're interviewing for, if you're interviewing for a company um, overseas, and they need to fly you in, then companies might do more rigorous background check before flying in because it costs more money to, for them to do so. But if I interview for companies locally, then they might skip a lot of those uh, off-site steps and just bring you on-site directly. And the on-site interviews can be very rigorous. Um, I think my interview at Google had like nine different in interviews and it was really stressful. Um, I think, um, this is just like some facts that I think I was very curious to know, which is um, the on-site to offer ratio and the offer due rate. So a lot of candidates ask me like, so after you get an on-site at, at a company, what is the chance that on-site turns into an offer? 
So like how many, what's percentage of on-site candidates get an offer from the company? And the year rate is like, out of all the people who get an offer, what percentage actually accept that offer? So I actually, so I collect like 16,000 reviews from Glassdoor at like 27 companies and try to figure it out. So there are a lot of biases in the, in the data set. Oh, anyway, so each data point has a reason, like whether like offer or no offer, uh, offer, accept offer or decline offer. So they have an experience was it positive, negative, or neutral. And the difficulty, like whether the candidate think it was difficult or easy, or it's just like medium interview. So there are a lot of biases because like very few people leave reviews for anything online. And uh, people who are, who leave reviews online are either compelled by a really good or really bad experience. And people who accept or who get an offer are also more likely to like leave reviews and those who don't. So there are a lot of biases. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of biases, so, but, but uh, if the biases are consistent across all reviews, then I think it might be useful once you use them to evaluate the company. So anyway, I think I don't have time, but here I just want to show like, some of the company with the highest on-site to offer ratio. And you could notice that like, the lowest on-site actually very competitive company like Facebook, Airbnb, Google. Um, and it's also that one thing to notice is that like, the more, the higher the the, the lower the offer rate, also the lower the yield rate. So it means that like, if a candidate gets very competitive offer from companies like Google or Facebook, it means that they have a lot of offer to choose from and might turn down that offer. Um, anyway, I don't have Tom. Um, so yeah, so here um, I talk a lot about machine learning interviews online on my Twitter. So follow me if uh, you want to get updated. Thank you. Thank you, Huyen, for your insightful speech.